Hey, welcome once again to the Journey Church, New York City. I'm Carrick, and I want to thank you for joining me today as we wrap up our powerful teaching series called I Need a Miracle. Now, during this series, we've been studying some of Jesus' most incredible miracles from the Bible in order to discover how you and I can experience the miracle we need in our own lives. And today, I want to talk to you about what to do when it feels like you're running out of everything. And you need a miracle. And so if you haven't yet, go ahead and click that button beside the live stream player. Download your message notes. You can use them to follow along and take notes during the message today. Now, look, running out of what you need stinks. And so I decided to put together a list of the top 10 worst things to run out of in New York City. I want to see if you agree with me on this. But these are the top 10 worst things to run out of in New York City. All right, number 10 on the list fair on your metro card. I have a monthly card and it only runs out when I'm late to a meeting. Number nine of worst things to run out of in New York City. Friends. In this city you need friends. You need a lot of support. Number eight of the worst things to run out of in New York City is patience. You got to have patience because you have to wait on everything in New York. Number seven of the worst things to run out of. You may have this higher on your list but it's money. Because everything in New York is more expensive. Number six on the worst things to run out of in New York City is energy. You've got to be energetic. It's always a, a fast-moving city, so you've got to have energy. Number five, toilet paper. I guess that's true anywhere. You never want to run out of toilet paper no matter where you are. Number four of things you don't want to run out of in New York City, black clothing. It's a fashion must in New York City. I mean, we wear black to Easter. Number three, umbrellas. You know, I got caught recently uh, without an umbrella walking to the subway in the rain. And trust me, you don't want to be there. You don't want to run out of umbrellas. Number two of the worst things to run out of in New York City, a sense of humor. You got to be able to laugh at yourself and your circumstances if you're going to survive. And then here's number one. The, the number one worst thing to run out of in New York City is hope. Hope. You can't survive in New York without hope. Look, when you feel like you're running out of the most important things in your life. It's easy to run out of hope. It's easy to feel defeated. And so let me ask you this. What do you feel like you're running out of right now? You might feel like, you know, I need more energy, Carrick, or I need more money. I need more support. I need more love. I, I need more opportunities in my life. I need more friends. I, I need a job. Maybe right now in your life it feels like you're running out of everything, of all the important things in life. And it's causing you to, to feel defeated and deflated. You're running out of hope and you need a miracle. If that's you, then today's miracle is for you. Because other than the resurrection, today's miracle that we're going to look at is the only one of Jesus' miracles that we find in all four Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And that tells us two things. It tells us that this miracle made quite an impression on the disciples. And it also tells us this, that this miracle we're looking at today is a very important miracle. And so let's jump in. We're going to look at the miracle of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And we find this in Mark chapter 6, beginning in verse 31. And so as we, as we begin this scene, as we begin the story, I want to set the scene for you. Because it's been an incredible busy time uh, for Jesus and for his disciples. Jesus' popularity is rising. He's teaching. He's healing. People are coming from all around just to be near him and see him. And Jesus and his disciples on this day, they're tired. They're exhausted. They're done. They need to get away. They have nothing left. So look at what happens next. Jump again. Mark chapter 6, verse 31. It says, then Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. So they left by boat for a quiet place where they could be alone. Now, I want you to notice this. Jesus recognizes that his disciples are tired, that they need a rest. And remember, even though Jesus was, was fully God, he was also fully human. And so he experienced fatigue in his own life. He knows what it feels like. He knows when you and I are, are feeling that way as well. And that's the first thing I want you to notice. The disciples ran out of energy. They were exhausted. They, they were done. And the second thing I want you to notice is that Jesus was aware of their need. He noticed what was going on. Now I want you to know this today. Jesus is aware 
of where you're running out right now. If you're running on empty, he's aware of that. If you're out of energy and you're out of strength and you don't know how you're going to be able to keep going, whether it's in your job or in your marriage or in school, if it's in your struggle with your kids, if you're just struggling keeping all the balls in the air without dropping any of the important ones right now, I want you to know Jesus sees you. He's aware. And so Jesus gets it. He knows what's going on. So he gets them all in a boat. They're going to cross the Sea of Galilee, which is a large freshwater lake in the northern part of Israel. And the goal is to get away from the crowds, to find a quiet place, to recuperate, to, to recharge, and to be alone. That sounds nice. And we all need that sometimes, right? A, a quiet place to, to recharge and, and, uh, and, and get back on track. That's, what, that's their plan, but that's not what happens. Let's go back into our story. We're, we're in verse 33 right now. It says, but many people recognized them and saw them leaving. And people from many towns ran ahead along the shore and got there ahead of them. And so picture this. All these people have come to see Jesus and, and, and hear Jesus, maybe even to, to, to be healed by Jesus. And they see that he's leaving by boat. And so they want to be with Jesus. So what do they do? They run alongside the shore of the Sea of Galilee following the boat. But not only that. As they run, more and more people join them. And so the crowd that was waiting for them when they got off the boat was actually larger than the crowd that they had just escaped from. It numbered in the thousands of people. And this is what happens in verse 34. It says, Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat and he turned around immediately and left. Wait, that's not what happened. That's that's probably what I would have done, but that's not what Jesus did. It says, Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat And he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. I don't know about you, but if I was exhausted and that happened to me and I was getting off the boat, I'd be like, "Uh uh-uh, no way. I would have gotten back in the boat. I would have gotten away because I I would have wanted that rest. I would have headed back across. And by the way, any ordinary person would have been intensely, at least intensely irritated and annoyed at, at that point. But not Jesus. Why? Because Jesus, the Bible says, had compassion on them. They they were lost. They were like sheep without a shepherd. They needed him. Now listen, right now in your life, whatever it feels like you're running out of, Jesus sees you. He has compassion on you. And he's not going to leave you. He is going to come to you and meet your needs. And that's what Jesus does here. Instead of running... He begins to teach the crowd many things. And he teaches for such a long time, in fact, that the entire day is now gone. We pick up the the passage in, in, in verse 35. It says, Late in the afternoon, his disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place. It's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to nearby farms and villages and buy something to eat. Now, hold your finger here. Because right now we're about to see two very different reactions to human need. When the disciples saw how late it was, when they saw how many people were there, when they saw how hungry the people were, they tried to absolve themselves of any responsibility in this in the situation. They didn't want to have anything to do with it. They said, so Jesus, you send them away so that they can find something to eat. It's not our problem. Jesus, we don't even want to be here in the first place. Now, let me make the point. In New York City, The needs around us are so overwhelming. And it's so easy to be just like the disciples were and say, hey, that's not my problem. But that can't be the reaction of the church to the needs of the people around us. We have to be willing to meet needs and feed the hungry and and help in any way that we can. And we see this in Jesus' response, very different than the disciples. They said, send them away, Jesus. But look at what Jesus says. But Jesus said, you feed them. You see, Jesus says to the disciples here, and he says it to the church today. It is your responsibility to meet the needs, to feed them spiritually, to feed them physically. In other words, we can't turn our backs on the needs that are around us. Then he continues. With, so Jesus says, feed them, and the disciples respond. With what, they ask? We'd have to work for months to earn enough money to buy food for all these people. In other words, they say, it's impossible. They throw their hands up. They're they're ready to give up. That's That's an impossible assignment, Jesus. And by the way, this is often our response. 
The needs are, are too great. You know, they're, they're, they're just uh, too many homeless. Do you see all the, the immigrants that are flooding into our city? Do you see all of the lost people? You know, we can't possibly meet all of those needs. And, and so here's what we do. Because we can't meet all the needs, we decide we're not going to meet any of the needs. Listen to me. Just because you can't meet every need doesn't mean that you shouldn't meet one need. The need that's in front of you. You know, whenever we we go out and we serve at graffiti community ministries and feed the homeless or with the relief bus to meet the needs uh, of the poor in our city, and we do it in Jesus' name, we're not able to feed everyone. We don't solve the problem of homelessness or or poverty in, in, in New York City. But it does make a difference in one person's life. And it does bring glory to Jesus when we do it. Going back into our story in verse 38, look at what it says. So Jesus said, they said, we can't do this. And Jesus says, how much bread do you have, he asked. Go and find out. They came back and reported, we have five loaves of bread and two fish. So Jesus sends them out to to find out how much food do we already have before we send them away. And by the way, this is a great lesson that Jesus is teaching. Before you begin complaining about what you don't have, take stock of what God has already blessed you with. You know, they had five loaves of bread. And by the way, these are not like bakery loaves of bread, these long, you know, French baguettes or anything like that. These are probably more like dinner rolls, if we're being honest. The the gospel writer of John, when John writes about this miracle, he says that they were barley loaves. In other words, not the best quality. Barley would have been the kind of bread that that the the more impoverished people would would have had. It was for for the poor people. And it wasn't a lot of bread. So they've got like five dinner rolls. This is they have two fish. And I understand here, we're not talking about largemouth bass here. We're probably talking about sardines, two little sardines. This, this would have been a meal for a child's lunch, a really small amount of food. So Jesus doesn't have a lot to work with here. But here's the thing, with Jesus, it doesn't take much. Jumping back in in verse 39. And then Jesus told the disciples to have the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of 50 or 100. Jesus took the five loaves and two fish, looked up towards heaven, and blessed them. By the way, another great lesson. Before you complain about what you don't have, stop and pause and thank God for what you already have, for what he has blessed you with. Because listen, when you thank God for what you have... Instead of complaining about what you don't have, well, God can take your little and he can turn it into a lot. And that's what he does here. And he continues. Then, breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people. He also divided the fish for everyone to share. Now, I I can't help this, but whenever I read uh, about uh, Jesus blessing and breaking the bread here, I can't help but think about the Lord's Supper. You know, Jesus sharing the Lord's Supper with his disciples in his final meal the night before he died. Now, I think here Jesus is foreshadowing the Lord's Supper. Instead of this time him breaking and giving the bread for everyone to eat in the Lord's Supper, it's a reminder of Jesus' body being given as a sacrifice for us. You know, this bread that he is breaking and blessing on this day is going to feed thousands. But the sacrifice of Jesus' body would be the hope of salvation For the entire world. Now let's continue our story in verse 42. So he uh, blessed the bread and fish and he sent it out. And then verse 42. They all ate as much as they wanted. And afterward the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftover bread and fish. A total of 5,000 men and their families were fed. Five dinner rolls, two sardines fed 5,000 men plus the women and children who were there with them. That The crowd was probably at least 8,000 people, if not more. Who knows? And then it says there were 12 baskets of leftovers afterwards. Why, why were there 12 baskets of leftovers? Well, it's because there were 12 disciples. The 12 disciples each had a basket, and they were, they were the ones serving the food. And so what it meant was whatever room they had, it was completely filled with leftovers. Whatever baskets they, they had. It was an amazing miracle. Look, maybe you're here right now, and you feel like the disciples. The needs in your life, they seem overwhelming. Your, your resources are inadequate. You're running out of energy. You're running out of money, out of strength, out of patience. You're running out of hope. And you need a miracle. 
Well, let's learn from Jesus today how to get one. And so uh, in your notes, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. What to do when I'm running out of energy. Here's the, I mean, when I'm running out of everything. What to do when I'm running out of everything. Write this in. I recognize that God is all I need. The first step, when you, when you feel like you're running out of everything, is I recognize that God is all I need. Let me ask you this. When, when you feel like you're running out of everything, who's the first person that you turn to? A friend? A family member? Or do you think, I, I'm going to handle this myself. I'm just going to work hard. I'm going to make more money. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get what I need. Now, by the way, none of those things is, is bad. But until you recognize that God is all you need... None of those other resources are going to help you. Turn first to the only person who knows what you need. Turn to God. Now, to give the disciples some credit, they knew this. You know, when they saw the problem and they didn't have enough food to feed all the people, even though their initial solution to the problem was wrong, they did turn to the right person. They turned to Jesus. You know, sometimes you'll go to Jesus... And you ask him, you know what you want to have happen, so you pray and you ask God to meet your needs in a certain way. And Jesus will reply to you. He'll say, I'm going to meet your needs, but I'm not going to meet your needs in the way that you expect. The way I'm going to do it is going to draw people to God. It's going to show people how amazing I am. You know, the 23rd Psalm reminds us of why we should turn to God when it feels like we're running out of everything. This is Psalm chapter 23, verse 1. I want you to read this verse out loud with me. So wherever you're joining us for church online, read this with me. Are you ready? Go. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. In other words, he's saying, listen, if the Lord is your shepherd, you're going to have everything that you need in your life. Because Jesus can take... Five loaves of bread and two fish, and he can feed you for months. He can provide for you any way that he chooses. If he turns off one job opportunity, he can turn on another just as easily. If one door closes, he can open another door for you. And so my trust isn't in my job or in how smart or in how skilled that I am or even in my bank account. My trust is in God. Look, the truth is, sometimes... We, sometimes God will allow a deficiency in your life. He'll, he'll allow a shortage of something that you really rely on so that you see that you cannot really rely on that person or that thing. And you, only, and you, you learn that you can only really rely on Him. You know, there's truth to the old adage. You don't know that God is all you need until God is all you got. And so sometimes God allows you to hit a dead end in life for a reason. To remind you that when you're running out of everything, He's all that you really need. And this is such an important principle for your life. Because let me tell you, sometimes the well is going to dry up. Sometimes the money is going to run out. Sometimes the business is going to stop coming. Sometimes the friends are going to stop calling. And then what are you going to do? Well, you're going to discover that what you've been relying on isn't enough. And you're going to turn to God. And so when you're running out of everything and you need a miracle, begin by recognizing that God really is all that you need. And then secondly, what do I do when I'm running out of everything? Secondly, I invite God to teach me through my situation. I invite God to teach me through my situation. I love this because God never wastes a challenge. He never wastes an obstacle in our lives or a problem. You know, in our story, the disciples saw a problem. But Jesus saw an opportunity, an opportunity to show people the power of God. Now, this is another important truth. God has something to teach you through whatever shortage you're experiencing in your life right now. The the Apostle James says it this way in James chapter 1, beginning in verse 2. He writes... Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an what? Opportunity. Circle that word opportunity. He says, whenever problems come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Listen, I love this. God can take those troubles that you're going through right now and he will use them to teach you and to grow you and to deepen your character. You know, some of you are emotionally empty right now. You're going through a time that's cold and dark 
and lonely, maybe you feel cut off. See, Jesus used this miracle as a time of preparation for his disciples. And maybe he's using this time in your life where you're running on empty as a time of preparation for you. God says you feel desperate now, like you're running out of everything. Good, because now I've got you where I want you. I'm ready to teach you something. I'm ready to strengthen you and grow you. I want your undivided attention. Because some of you are in a situation right now and, and the money's just not there. You know, the support isn't there. The, the energy isn't there. Your health isn't there. And something that was once very good is suddenly gone. Something that once brought you great joy is now disappointing you. Here are three things that God might be teaching you during this difficult time. I left you some space in your notes. Uh, it's not a fill-in, but I just want you to write it in the margins of your notes. Three, three things God might be teaching you during this time when you feel like you're running on empty. Here's the first one. Stop depending on something other than God. Stop depending on something other than God. Write that in your, the margin of your notes. The first reason God might allow you to run out of something in your life is to keep you from depending on that something rather than God. Is there, let me ask you this, is there anything in your life right now that you depend on more than God? Maybe it's a girlfriend or a boyfriend or a spouse. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your bank account. Again, those aren't bad things. But if, if you're looking to any of those things for your security other than God, rather than God, that's a mistake. So sometimes God says, whatever you're trusting in, if it's not me, I'm going to turn it off so that you'll learn to trust in me. So he may be teaching you that. Stop depending on something other than God. The second thing he may want to teach you is to make a change. He may, he may be trying to encourage you to make a change in your life. Write that in. Make a change. Maybe you've become so comfortable with where you are that, that you won't listen to God when he's asking you to make a needed change. And so God is going to push you. He's going to kick you out of your comfort zone. He's going to bring about a change for your own good. Listen, what, what you think... Uh, is bad. You know, I lost my job. My, my boyfriend or my girlfriend uh, broke up with me. What you think of as bad may very well be the best thing that has ever happened to you. The thing you thought was going to destroy you is the thing that actually strengthens you. And so sometimes God allows you to run out because he's ready to make a change in your life. And then here's the third lesson that God might want to teach you in, in your time of, of emptiness. God has not forgotten you. God wants to show you that. God has not forgotten you. When things go wrong in your life, you know, we often think, oh no, God's not here. God's, God's forgotten about me. He's not paying attention. Look, I want, I want to be very honest with you. I want you to understand this. God has not forgotten you. But he does want, you, he does want to give you a new perspective and a fresh start. And you know, when you feel forgotten and like you don't have enough, Pay attention to what God is doing. He's teaching you to depend on Him. He's inviting you to make a change in your life. And He's reminding you that He's there and that He cares about you. Now, back in your notes, here's the third lesson we learned from, from Jesus' miracle. When it feels like you're running out of everything, here's our third lesson. I praise God for what He's already given me. Write that in. I praise God for what He's already given me. And again, let me say this again. Before you begin to fret... And, and get fearful over what you don't have, pause, take stock of all the blessings that you do have, and be thankful for what God has already given you. I, I love what this next passage says in Psalm 106, beginning in verse 1. It says, Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His faithful love endures forever. Who can list the glorious miracles of the Lord? Who can ever praise Him enough? You know, in our story, what was interesting is the disciples looked past what God had provided. But Jesus took what God had provided, he blessed it, and thanked God for it, and it became the source of the miracle. And I want you to understand, the same can be true for you. God can take the little you have, and that little bit can become the ultimate source of the miracle. I want you to pause right now. You feel empty, maybe you feel alone, maybe you feel forgotten. But who or what could you thank God for right now? Something or some, someone who's already in your life and who's a blessing. Who, who could you just pause and thank God for right now? See, start with thankfulness over what you have, not resentment over what you don't have. That will be the point 
That will, that will point you to the miracle from Jesus that you need. Start with thankfulness, not resentment. If you praise God for what you already have, God will use it. Because let me tell you, Jesus specializes in turning a little bit into a lot. And then here's the next step you should take when it feels like you're running out of everything. Write this in. I allow God to use what I have. I allow God to use what I have. Now, what I mean here is don't just thank God for what you have, but give it to Him to use and multiply. Let God take what you have and multiply it and bring about a miracle. Because let me tell you what happens. This is what happens when when you feel like you're running uh, out of things. You naturally become protective of the little bit that you have. You know, I don't have a lot. So I've got to hoard it. I've I've got to protect it. I've got to be stingy. I've got to hold it close because I don't have a a, a lot. I've got to keep it from God. But let me tell you that what you should do. Because when you hold it back from God, God can't take it and multiply it and use it to bring about a miracle. You know, in the Gospel of John, when John uh, writes about this miracle that we're reading about in Mark, he he has a few other details. And and in his his account, it was a little boy who brought the disciples and Jesus the five loaves and the two fish. What if that little child had said, Oh man, I'm looking around. There's thousands of people here. No one else brought anything to eat. I better hold on to what I have. I better keep it close. I don't want anybody to see it. Or I'm not going to have anything to eat. There's not enough for everybody, so I've got to hoard it. I'm I'm not going to share it, even though the disciples asked. And that's that's the attitude we often have. And again, it's the attitude that's going to prevent God from working a greater miracle in your life. In 2 Corinthians 9, 6, the Apostle Paul talks about uh, the opposite attitude. He says, remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. I think this is one of the incredible things about Jesus. It's when you give that you're blessed. It's when you serve that your needs are met. It's when you're generous that God shows up. What are you holding back from God right now? Because you don't think you have enough. And because of that, because of of that lack of generosity, He can't bless you. Maybe finances aren't the way that you would like them to be. So you say, you know what? I, I, I'm not going to tithe. I, I, I'm running out. I better hold tightly to what I have. But God wants, you, wants to take what you give him and work a miracle. If you'll trust him and be generous and, and tithe, he'll bless it. Maybe you're running out of time. So you say, well, I, I can't serve on a service team. I can't be in a growth group. I can't go to church on Sunday. I, I, I'm so busy. I can't give God my, my time. And you get more and more stressed. But let me tell you this, if you give your time to God, it's a miracle. God takes that time and multiplies it. The point is, God won't multiply and bless what you're unwilling to give to Him. It's going to continue to deteriorate. So what are you withholding from God right now? Where are you not being obedient? Where are you you not allowing God to use what He's already blessed you with? If you feel like you're running out and you need a miracle... Trust God with what you already have. And then here's the final step to take. When it feels like you're running out of everything, the final lesson that we learn from the feeding of the 5,000, write this in. I trust God to meet my daily needs. I trust God to meet my daily needs. Now listen, during the tough times, it's a day-by-day process. You take it one day at a time. And sometimes you have to get on your knees at the beginning of the day And you got to say, okay, God, it's tough right now. It's tough in in this area of my life, and I need you. I need you, God, to meet my needs for today. I trust you to do that. You know, the people in our story today, they didn't have food for that day. But Jesus performed a miracle. He took five dinner rolls and two sardines and fed thousands and thousands of people. Right now, you can trust God to meet your needs today. Give Him today. And he will take care of you. Give him your day, day by day, one day at a time. Psalm 145, verse 13. It's a powerful psalm. And and I want you to listen as, as I read. I'll put it up on the screen as well. It says, The Lord always keeps his promises. He is gracious in all he does. The Lord helps the fallen and lifts those bent beneath their loads. The eyes of all look to you in hope. You give them their food as they need it. When you open your hand, you satisfy the hunger and thirst of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in everything He does. He is filled 
with kindness. Look, God promises that he will meet your needs if you will put your trust in him. What are your greatest needs right now? Where does it feel like you're running out of everything? Will you lay down your worry and stress and anxiety and will you trust Jesus to meet your needs today? I love this promise from the Apostle Paul. It's our memory verse for today. It's found in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. I want us to, to, to read this final verse, our memory verse, out loud together. So wherever you're joining us for church online, read this with me right now. Are you ready? Go. And this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to notice. It doesn't say God might supply all of your needs. It doesn't say that God is going to try to supply all of your needs. No, it says that God will supply all of your needs from his glorious riches. God says, I will meet all of your needs in Christ. Christ. That's a promise from God. And God doesn't lie. He won't let you run out. He won't let your head go under the water. So you can trust him. You can put your hope in him. Do you know Jesus? If you don't, you can get to know him right now. Let's bow our heads and go to God in prayer right now. I want to pray for you. If, you're, if you feel like you're running out of everything, I want to pray for you. But if you've never gotten to know Jesus, if you've never stepped across the line and become a follower of his and secured your eternity in heaven, you can also do that right now as we pray. So if you would bow your head, close your eyes. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, I want to pray for everyone listening to me right now who feels like they're running out of something they desperately need. Money, time, health, friends, family, energy. As we learn from Jesus' miracle today, may they turn to you for what they need. And God, would you provide the miracle that they need? And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, if you've never put your trust in him as your Lord and Savior, so you've never, you've never experienced him working a miracle in your life, and you don't know where you will spend eternity after you die, Today, you can settle that. You can get right with God and step across the line. If you're ready to do that, just pray the simple prayer with me. Pray it silently in your heart as I pray it out loud. This is the simple prayer. Jesus, today for the first time, I put my trust in you. I know I've lived my life apart from you in sin. But today I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins and that he rose from the dead. And I ask you to come into my heart and forgive me of my sins and secure my eternity in heaven. I commit to follow you, Jesus, as the leader and Lord of my life, as a part of your church from this day forward. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.